Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jan Roos, and I am here today with an exciting guest in Ken Hardison of Pilma. So Ken is one of the OGs of the space. I've been hearing a lot of really great things from him over the years. I'm super excited to have him on. So thanks for coming on the show, Ken. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure, man. All right. Awesome. One of the things I wanted to start with, so I was doing a little research on, you know, just press prepping for the show. And I noticed that you guys have one of the ballsiest guarantees that I have ever seen in this space, which is you guys guarantee that people working with you are going to have a 25% increase in their business. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, you're not going to be putting a guarantee like that if you know you can hit it every time. So I was just curious, like, you know, how do you guys, I'm sure that you guys have a, a process to, to getting those people those gaps. Like what kind of things are you looking at when somebody joins a program that you guys are able to close to make sure you're hitting those goals? The first thing is we have a program where I got training modules and I go after the low hanging fruit to start with the things that I teach. But, but, you know, not everybody's going to do it. But what I say is the 25% guarantee is if you don't grow 25% a year and you show me at least one, you've done at least one thing I've told you to do, then it's free for another year or until you get 25% growth. Most people are getting a lot more. You know, the deal is you, if you join it and they're not going to do anything, then I'd really just, and I got a 90 day money back guarantee the first 90 days. If you get it, you like, well, this is just too much work for me that I just give you money back hundred percent. Here's my deal. This, this is what I always did with my law firm. Everything I've done is money back, all my events, all my coaching programs, my masterminds. And the deal is, the reason I do it is simply because lawyers are so damn skeptical of it. It's, you know, they are, and I'm one of them, so I can say it. I mean, you know, we're trained to be skeptical. I mean, you know, that's what law school does. I mean, we're supposed to look for the worst. We, we think of the worst, and that's our job, to prevent people from, you know, making mistakes and I've always thought about it. If, if your stuff's not good enough that you can't guarantee it, then, then what, you don't believe in it yourself. I mean, you know, my deal is, and this is a long play. It's not a short play. I'm not after the quick bunny. I want to build relationships and I want to help people. If I'm not helping you, I don't want your money. I know it sounds corny, but the deal is when I had my law firm, I was the first, I had a PI practice in North Carolina and I was, I drove everybody crazy. I, I put a guarantee on, uh, I said, the first 30 days, if you're not completely satisfied the way we treat you in your case, you can come get your file, no fees, no costs. And everybody thought I was crazy, you know. But the deal is, my, uh, my you know, I went up 23% with the same budget in signups. And in seven years, I, I sold it. I started that like seven years before I sold out in 2010. I had two people bring want their files back. Right. But I got 23% increase. So you can figure out the numbers. But the deal is, I was really big on client service, and we papered everybody to death the first 30 days so that they knew, and talked to them two or three times, and so they knew we were working on the case. And and it worked. I mean, it worked. And then now I see some other firms doing it. I didn't trademark it or copyright it or anything because I mean, you know, but all the lawyers said, you know, we can't, no way we can do that. But my deal is, when somebody's choosing a lawyer, there's, it's like me trying to. If I was getting ready to have back surgery, I'd want to check it out. The only problem is once I go through that, I kick back out, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but with a lawyer, you could get involved in it and they sign the contracts, you know, retainer agreements or contingency. We, we have contingency agreements for PI, disability, and workers' comp, which is what I did the last 15, 20 years of practice. I did, I've done everything. I've done domestic criminal and government contract and bank. I've done everything. Uh, I, I was coming from a small town where you had to be a jack of all trades, but if you don't believe in what you do, I mean, I don't know. It, to me, it just seems like, uh, I want them people to be okay that they're making. And it, it's kind of, I call it the risk reversal, right? I'm taking the risk. You're not, but the deal is if I believe in what I'm doing and I know I do, know, I, do, I know I'm good. I mean, yeah. you know, like we're from the South. So, you know, when you, it's not bragging if you're telling the truth. So if we're good and we give good client service, then why not do it? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I know maybe it's a little arrogant, but I don't know. I just feel that way. I mean, you yeah. Know, and, uh, 
I totally agree too. And like, the thing is, it's like, you know, the risk reversal at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you're not serving the client or the people that you could help if you're not doing what you can to overcome the blocks that are in their mind too. And what I find fascinating is I hadn't even thought about a risk reversal for personal injury because everyone thinks that the fact that it's on contingency is the risk reversal. But yeah. I find it fascinating that you took it one step further. The risk isn't I paid money and I'm not getting anything out of this. The risk is I took my case with the wrong attorney and he's just sitting on the file, which, you know, is more common than, than a lot of people want to think, unfortunately. Yes. But, um, you know, that's, that's next level stuff. And I think the numbers absolutely speak to the fact that you guys were able to do that. So, um, I think that's, you know, first of all, off this with a super innovative tip off the jump again. So thanks for that. But, um, I wanted to dig in a little bit more into that, that whole concept of low hanging fruit. So I guess like, what are the common things that, that you guys see? And like, you know, if, if somebody's walking around, they're not, you know, hitting the full potential of the law firm, like, I guess, what are the most common things that you see that people can close as far as gaps? The number one, the number one. And I mean, this has been, this is world renowned. I mean, this is like, I see the most leakage, the most waste of money is poor intake people. And it's whether it's on the phone or, or internet, at least they're, they're, lawyers are terrible. I mean, listen. I started a whole company just because of this. Yeah. I, I started this company. I lost it last year. Lawyers ghost calls, and we do ghost calls, and we grade them, and then send the owner. The uh, we grade them and tell them what they're doing right and doing wrong, and then let them listen to it and use it for training purposes. But you would, I've seen law firm owners. I used to do consulting work, and I would go to their firm, and they would always I give them you know something to fill out. They say, "Oh, I sign up every case I want." And they might, but they're not answering all the calls. I can promise you. And probably I, I sit there and play five, and no, only one firm in like five years got four out of five. Most of them was two or three out of five got the calls right, and they were just losing cases left and right. And so what we try to do is get people to number one, we have an intake training with a lady that's like they call her the phone sales doctor. She is better than me. And she does trainings every month to all our members. And then like my masterminds, I give them some of the ghost calls free and they use those. So also I get them to start keeping track of every call and start thinking about, it's not the conversions of how many leads versus how many conversions of how many total leads. It's I want to know the conversion rate of the cases I really wanted because really you should be hitting 95%. And what I found most law firms around 75 to 85%. So here's the deal. If I'm getting a hundred leads a month and I'm signing up 25, if I could bump that up to 10% to 35 and my average fee is 5,000, do I need to tell you anything else? I mean, yeah. do, the, do the math. That's an extra over a half a million dollars a year. And that's what I see. So that's probably I know not probably it is the biggest gap. That's the biggest leakage I see in law firms. And the deal is the lawyers are blind to it. It's a blind spot. They think because they probably do sign up about every case that they talk to the potential client, but how many calls never get to them? How yeah. many calls? It's like this new program I got out. I was talking to my, I do a Q and a every month. I was talking to a lawyer in Atlanta. He said, I had this guy come to me. It's called Inca I N C A. And what it is, it's software. And it's very cheap. If somebody calls your office and they miss somehow the call gets dropped or whatever, or you don't answer the call, it's 24 seven, it shoots them a text message mm -hmm. and then starts the dialogue, you know, and, and, and it keeps people from dialing another lawyer because that's what they're going to do. Right. If they don't right. Get up. So things like that and having, uh, having answering services after hours, and then really taking advantage of getting these Google reviews and getting on the local Google Maps is another, I think, way to do it. It takes a little longer, but that's one thing. And then the third thing is really, I wrote a book uh, called Under Promise Over Deliver. Hmm. And I, I talk about the three phases of mark, legal marketing before representation, which everybody does. And then really really nurturing those clients to get them to where they'll refer you clients and probably 50% of lawyers do that. But then after representation, only about 20% of lawyers, even they just, just, they just forget about these people. And these people, if you did a good job for them, they're gold because why do you want to spend money getting somebody to hire you that don't know you don't trust you don't like you trying to convince them to hire you when you've got people back here that if you were work them, they could be repeat customers or they can refer you somebody. 
And so I've, I've developed a lot of the proprietary ways. I got like 15 different way referral systems that I teach at Pilma to get clients, old clients to refer you back cases. And some of them work quickly and some of them take up to a year. I mean, some of this stuff takes time, right? Mm-hmm. And some of it you can see overnight. That's I call that the low hanging fruit. I mean, stuff that's just sitting there that you're just not, it's just easy. I mean, listen, if you can, like, and I, I tell a lot of them too, you know, sometimes you need to raise your price and they look at me like I'm crazy. And so, well, I'm afraid they won't hire me. It's like I was at an event. I, I do these big events and the, the next one's in September the 29th through October 2nd. Mm-hmm. And down in New Orleans at the Ritz Carlton, I have four or 500 lawyers show up. It's a marketing and management associate service, big, big annual event. But I had this. The domestic lawyer stand up one day and she asked me at the end of the deal, she says, well, here's my problem, Ken. I'm getting more business than I can handle. She says, I'm just, you know, I know how to get the cases. My problem is I just don't, you know, I can't do no more. She says, and I just can't find good associates or whatever. I said, well, how much do you charge an hour? She says, $300. I said, well, go to $600. She says, well, I'll lose half my clients. I said, yeah, absolutely. You will. <laughs> it's perfect. And you have to work. Yeah, I said, much. <laughs> you, you, you'll make the same amount of money and work half as much time. I said, there's a thing called for non-contingency lawyers for, for fee retainers or hourly. It's called uh, price elasticity. And the deal is, and I teach this too. There's, it's sort of like a graph. You have to keep going up and then look at your conversions and say, your conversions might go down a little bit, but you get it to a sweet spot where, you're making really good money without having to work so many cases. Yeah. Because when it comes down to it, it's all about the bottom line, unless you just want to work yourself to death, you know? And then the other thing is get, get associates. And, uh, yeah. How are you going to hire that without the pricing too? Cause it's like, and this is the thing I think a lot of people and like a lot of this stuff, can we get a lot of <laughs> taking copious notes of, of uh, rabbit holes? I want to go back down, but like on the pricing note too, I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize this from like a price elasticity perspective, because like, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll say something like in the, in the uh, estate planning space, there's some people who have crazy competition from stuff like legal zoom and yeah. they know, oh, well, Joey down the street ends up uh, charging 1500 and I charge 2,500. It was like, well, do you know who you probably know more about what your competition's charging than the people who are walking in your office. And I hate to break it to you. If somebody's going to be char- charging, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, most, if, if you're charging a respectable minimum retainer, that's probably going to be the biggest purchase that somebody's going to make in the next couple of years outside of a home or a car. So whether it's five thousand or seventy five hundred, it doesn't really make a difference to most people at the end of the day. And you know, we have a, a pretty real pain for almost any situation you can find yourself in as a lawyer. So you know, it's just about you know, do you want to live in a practice where you have margin to reinvest in the help, or do you want to work yourself to the bone? Because if it's not coming out of their pocket, it's coming out of yours in one way or another, right? Yeah, I mean. And the deal is, I remember, you know, I said I used to do everything. This back in the '80s and early '90s, I did a lot of DWI work, DUI work in some states, and uh, I was the most expensive guy in town. But I, I was, I was really good. I mean, like the last 52 cases I did it, before I quit doing it in '98, I won 48 out of 52. So I had a knack for it. But I'd have them come in there and say, "Well, Joe down the road will do it for 500," and I was charging like 3,000. I said. Five hundred dollar lawyer, go get a five hundred dollar lawyer. I said, you know, <laughs> you pay for what you get. And then I tell them the story about my dad when I was building a house and I tried to get the cheapest contractor, and I had to end up tearing my roof off. And my dad said, "I told you to get the most expensive one." He was the one. I said, "You spent more now." And then I ended up having to get the most expensive one to fix the guy that was cheaper. So cheap is not always cheaper, and uh, I don't know. I, I just think that everybody's scared. And I think that's the wrong way to be. You never want to compete on price. Okay. If you've got to compete on price, then you're not going to, somebody you'll lose in the end because there'll always be somebody that will undercut you. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't, I mean, there'll always be somebody. And, and we can look at stores like uh, Kmart. They're pretty much gone now. JCPenney pretty much gone now. I mean, you know, these, People, I used to have lawyers that would, uh, and everybody go crazy in my market. They would say, you know, everybody charged a third. They were doing it for like twenty percent, twenty five percent. I said, don't worry about it. Yeah. I said, you know, and I did, and they and they end up falling out because they they cut each other out. And the people that are looking for the deals, I don't want those people anyway because they're always hard to deal with. They're always 
penny pitching me on everything. I, and it's like, uh, I know that, you know, just the ones like that, I just don't want, I mean, you yeah. know, they're just, they're just bad clients. I don't need it. It's true to you guys. Like I, I kind of see this as like a very common, like, I wouldn't go so far as to say naive, but it's a kind of business plan you'll see in a lot of lawyers in their first couple of years and not in their later couple of years. Well, you know, we're going to do really good work. I just came from a big firm. It's going to be as good as the big firm, but it's going to be at a reasonable price. And they don't realize that over time, it's it's like, you know, this is a thing. And like you just mentioned Kmart, right? It's like, you know, it doesn't pay to be the second least expensive. And I'm sorry, you're not going to be cheaper than legal zoom anytime soon. So if you can kind of take that as, a, as a given, you know, like you can be, and this is the thing too, like a lot of people, like, you know, you, I, I used to joke about this. It's like, you know, no one goes in and says like, yeah, I want the cheapest plastic surgeon. I, I want them you give me the, the, the cheapest guy to do my nose. <laughs> or like I want the cheapest parachute you can find. And yeah. you guys got to realize you're in the same category as that. Like, you know, these are, these are big issues. I wanted to go into something else as well, because like this is something that I found really fascinating as far as um this whole thing about re uh, uh, referrals. Too. Like, I find that a lot of people are going at this in totally the wrong way. You know, I can speak of this from experience when I ended up starting the agency or in the early days, like I was going to B&I and I and I saw people just absolutely killing themselves. And you could see because they had the scorecards for this. They're having 50 coffee meetings a week with, you know, a massage guy and an interior decorator and all this stuff too. And people put in crazy hours with everyone except for the person who knows how you run your service. <laughs> so how do you recommend people focus their time more effectively and, you know, get those referrals out of the people that actually know what they can do for them? Yeah. I always tell people to look at, like for injury law, who, who do these people go to before or right after? Who do they talk to before or right after they need your services? Like if somebody gets a DWI, they want to see a bail bondsman. They might see a, a jailer. I mean, uh, they might be talking to an insurance agent. Okay. Why would I want to get those people that are going to see the people that I'm seeing? If, uh, if I'm doing estate planning, I might want to be talking to a tax attorney or a CPA. Those are the people that are going to have, they're the people that got money that need planning, right? Mm -hmm. If they can hire, you know, if it's domestic law, I mean, I might want to be talking to a lot of counselors because, I mean, I've been through some marriage counseling. I mean, I'm, I'm on my second marriage. And uh, sometimes they tell you, hey, y'all need to get divorced. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, they do. I mean, uh, I had one tell me that. <laughs> so you, you never know. I mean, so I always try to look at that. Like, I tell lawyers that I want dog bite cases. I said, well, why don't you talk to the animal control officer? I'm sure they would know a lot about dog bite cases and get, get friends with them and help them. And the other thing is, you can't just go ask somebody for a referral. You've got to go in and know them that go in there and see what you can do to help them. And then hopefully they'll help you back and knowing that 50% of the time you're not going to win. Okay. That you're going to not going to get the reciprocity. Right. But that's when they ask for other professionals, but, I think your past clients are your best mini, make them all your mini marketers, man. I, I've got some things that I'm not going to reveal them all here today. <laughs> That's fair. People, yeah. people pay me a lot of money, you know, but uh, I'll just say this. There's a lot of, lot of lost opportunities with past clients. And, and one thing is I'll say this, I will give this clue. People newsletters, you want to stay in front of them. Uh, I, I call it putting a, a fence around your herd because these lawyers think that uh, if you use them and they're all important that, Hey, you'll remember them five years from now. And that's just not the fact. That's not the truth. Mm -hmm. They might remember what your face looks like, but they won't remember your name. Or you might change locations. They go there and they say, well, he was here. And I don't know where he's at. And I can't remember the name of the firm. So that's, you're out of luck. So staying in front of them, but, uh, and then, I've got this whole formula for a newsletter. It's got to be short on about a seventh grade level and it's got to be entertaining and no more than 25% about law. Have it about what's going on with you. I try to develop a relationship. Here's what I try to do. I try to, I want them to think of me as their trusted legal advisor. No matter what they need, I will, if I can't help them, I'll find somebody. Cause I don't want them to try to figure out what I do and don't do. And then some might be some stuff to where I could get a referral fee. If I'm a state lawyer and I say, listen, this, you, you drill in their head. I got in every newsletter I ever did was we want you to think of us as your trusted legal advisor. They used to have lawyers argue, but I don't want all these calls. I said, well, 
you don't want somebody to call you about a miso case where you can refer out and get a third of a million dollar fee. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you? And then those people become to trust you more and they're not going to go to anybody else. And then they're going to refer all their friends and family to you because they trust you because listen, people are going to refer and go to hire lawyers. They know, like, and trust. It's all about building relationships. When I was practicing law, I go in the grocery store, man, and people would come up to me and ask me about my daughter's wedding because I put everything in about that. And I wouldn't even know their names. I mean, I, but I acted like I did. And I'd say, how, y- <laughs> how your family's doing and all that. You know, we do that. We did a lot of things for our past clients. But you do build that relationship where they almost feel like they know you personally. And that's going to be the people that they're going to, they're going to refer to lawyers that they feel that way with, right? Yeah. And I got to say too, that's a golden tip. Like this is the thing, like a lot of the times too, we get on uh, people just end up adding us to our mailing list and, you know, shame on us for doing as much email marketing as we do outbound. This is only fair, but I get to see a lot of newsletters from people that do it. And it tends to fall into two camps, neither of which I think are particularly productive. It's like, you got the person who's doing like the advanced review of case law for whatever their their district is that no one cares about. And the other one is, yeah, talking about, yeah, we got new carpets at the office and like, but it's, it's like definitely, uh, you know, as far as making it personal, but I guess that's a really important point too, getting the 25% legal. So they remember you are a lawyer. You're not just some sort of a, you know, dancing clown trying to get in front of people's attention, but if you can strike the balance and that's the thing too, it's like, I think there's a big opportunity too. Cause I mean, I would say, you know, based on this conversation and other conversations we've had being extremely personable is in a lot of people's strong suits. So, you know, it doesn't matter if it isn't your specialty too. And like, I think that's also a super golden thing too. If you're talking about closing gaps and low hanging fruit, you know, sometimes people, uh, you know, in the course of what we're doing for marketing, people get super ticked if somebody has a different need, but it's like, okay, well, do you want 25% of a case you don't have to do any work on learn how to do that intake, right? It's like, it's going to be worth it at the end of the day. And then yeah. uh, just one kind of like uh, other thing to just tell as far as like, you know, actually getting to the point, cause you ended up selling your practices as well. Right. Ken. Yeah. I had two of them. I built, yeah. That's yeah. I, have, I sold one in 2010 and then some lawyer at a, at a conference said, well, I just don't have the money you, cause I did, I went out and borrowed a half a million dollars when I started my big practice that I sold in 2010. Hmm. I had been with other firms, you know, and I started my own in 2000 and then, uh, 96, 96, 97. Hmm. And some lawyer said, well, I don't have that kind of money. Da, da. I said, well, how much do you have to spend? He said, $6,000 a month. I said, okay. So I went and started a social security firm and spent $6,000 a month and sold it two years later for seven figures. <laughs> and I, had awesome. about, I had about 800 K active cases in it. And I, I got those 800 cases with a uh, hundred and whatever six times 24 is, uh, I guess. Um, yeah, about $140,000. So, and I, I got real lucky and maybe, maybe you call it lucky. I don't know, but I figured out how to get social security cases for less than $200 a piece. And you ain't gonna believe what I did. I, I, I got invited to be on this lawyer who is another good marketer. He's in my master minds and stuff down here in South Carolina. He does PI and workers comp, but he, uh, he did a show every noon at Thursday on the NBC affiliate here. And it was like, I can't remember what's the name. I was like, ask the lawyers or whatever, but he was smart. He only, he, every week he would have, he would do two weeks every month on one on PI, one on workers comp where he would be there and his associates but the other two weeks he'd bring in like a criminal lawyers two criminal lawyers two social security lawyers two family lawyers two estate planning lawyers and what happens is they're getting cases because of being on a tv show and what do you think they're doing they're sending him cases because he's helped them they don't charge them anything for it he pays for everything they get all the exposure so who are they going to send a pi case to my man mr mcguire yeah and so I go on there and I got, I'm big on educational based marketing. I had done this book, Disability Secrets Revealed. And I was on there and I, and I asked him before we started, I said, can I offer this free book? And he said, I don't see no problem. And the producer said, oh, no, we can't do that. I said, well, listen, he's paying the bill. I said, he says we can do it. We're going to do it. And so what I did, I took the, not our, our phone number. We had an 800 number. I took that and put it on a sticky note behind the book. And at the end of it, I held the book up. And I said, you know, if you want this free book, Disability Secrets Revealed, how to, how to double your chances of winning your disability case, I said, call this number. 
and I and I read it out twice. Didn't have it up. Didn't have any graphics, anything. I get back to the office about twenty minutes after the show's over with, and my girls are saying, "What in the hell have you <laughs> done?" She said, "We've got like eighty calls wanting this book." I said, "Really?" She said, "Yeah, we can't get anything done. We're just asking the call." And I said, "Damn!" So I started an infomercial, and I had I hired this TV guy to interview me on the book. And I, and I had the whole deal the whole time. I get you call this free recorder and get your book. And then after I did that, I did a bunch of mailings and different things, you know, a lot of uh, multi-step marketing. And I was, it was, and I was getting these show times down here in Myrtle beach for like $600 for a show, you know, on Saturday or Sunday morning, which was the best times I, I learned that the hard way. And we were just killing it. And so I was getting cases you know, for nothing. I mean, you know, your average fee is three thousand. You're paying two hundred dollars to get the case. That's that's really good return. You know, fifteen to one. That's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic too. I and mean, it sounds like you know, there's a lot of also things like <laughs> Ken. I don't know if you realize this, but the density of value in the statements that you're making, <laughs> it's making it, it's fantastic. And I love it, but it's tough for me to pick what, uh, which, uh, which step to take next, which is fantastic. But like, so you've got this guy who's kind of made himself sort of, I mean, not to make too much of it, but like, kind of like, you know, sort of in an Oprah kind of position, he's gotten you on and you've figured out a way to get the, I guess what some people would call the lead magnet strategy. And then what yeah. year, uh, what year around are we talking for this? Uh, that happened in 2000 and. 13 because I sold it. Yeah, mid 2013 because I sold that firm in mid 2015. Uh, 2015. Yeah, I had done one back at my old law firm in Raleigh on workers' comp, and we would not get a lot of calls to be honest with you. We would get maybe 10 or 12 calls, and down in Raleigh market, it was a lot more. It would cost like 2,000 back then, mm -hmm. which probably cost four or five thousand, but they were really good cases. What we found out was. The people that watch this stuff, they had really good cases because they, they, it's like 80% of the cases that we signed up off of that show were surgical cases. I mean, six figure cases, which mm. workers got, and which meant anywhere from, I mean, average fee of around 30,000. So it was still worth it. I mean, if we only signed up three cases, we spent 2,000 and get three cases and make that, you know, 90,000, that's, that's still good, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, like, but, but, you know, so we'll see. I mean, you know, but then, you know, when I sold it out, they quit doing it. They quit doing a lot of things that I did, but they're still doing good. But they just not as aggressive as I was, I, I, I guess. I mean, because, you know, I was growing like, well, I put it this way. I went, started in 97 with me and two staffers. And in 2002, I had 13 lawyers and 47 staff. Wow. Uh you know, we were having, we had so much growth that one year, I just really cut my marketing budget in half. And I said, this is going to be a infrastructure year. We got to get caught up because we mm -hmm. were really, they want to do bad client service. And I could tell we were, we were getting there. We were getting a couple because I had a client, I had an 800 client advocate hotline, you know, and we were getting too many calls. And I had, a, I had my office manager. her own private cell phone that, that nothing but that call went to it. She had to keep it with her eight. 24 seven. Wow. Well, you know, but we, we really, we pushed client service. So we, we had a client bill of rights. We had a client advocate hotline. I mean, we really pushed it. I mean, I never told them I could get them the most money. I never told them that I was tough and you know, that I'd get them the biggest award. I never, I never held the checks up. I never did anything like that. I just told them, you know, that, uh, they would be number one. They, everything we, I call it the theory of preeminence. I learned this from Jay Abraham, one of my, one of my two best mentors I've ever had. And he, he calls it the theory of preeminence. Everything you do, you do for the betterment of your client. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell people at the firm, I said, just, if you got a decision to make, just, all you gotta do is say that, say that statement and that'll tell you what you need to do. If it's for the betterment of the client, then we do it. If it's not, we don't do it. I mean, yeah. you know, that very simple, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, you know, some of this stuff is just so simple. It's stupid, but, but you know, you don't have to, like this treat people the way you want to be treated i used to have that deal you know yeah i mean you know I, in fact i stole this from jeffrey gittimer we had a deal i had a client service manual at our firm and they had to take it before, I, before they could be totally hired they had to take it and score 80 percent or better on it or they didn't get hired and but one of the deals was they had to put i told her i said when you're talking to our clients 
put grandma at the end of the sentence. And if you wouldn't tell you, talk to your grandmother like that, then don't talk to our clients like that. And it kind of got them in the right. I had to change the mindset. You know, I had to, I had to make sure that they knew, uh, you know, I would, I would fire people over not treat the clients right. But then also I would fire clients if they were mean to our, our staff. I, I, and they loved me because of that. I was tough, but I was also on their side. I, if a client was cur- cursed at them or something, and they'd tell me, I called a client, say, you got, you know, I just, I don't allow them to do it to anybody. They get fired if they curse. I don't allow it. We're professional and I'm not going to let you do it. So you got two choices. You can call them up and apologize and uh, not do it again. And we'll keep representing. And if you can't, you come get your file. Well, when my staff figured, do I did that, man, they, they, they brought through damn fire for me because they knew that I really cared about them, you know, that I, I won't let them be abused. You know, I've always said, this is another one of my little sayings. Your staff's going to treat your clients the way you treat your staff. I really believe that. So, you know, treat them right. Treat them, you know, professional. And I ne- I've never cursed. I've never hollered at an at a, uh, employee. Now, listen, don't mean I hadn't got on them, but I do it in private. I never embarrass them. I always say praise in public, criticize in private. Yeah. It's like, and like a lot of like wisdom for this too. It's like, as far as, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting position too. Cause like, I feel like every market's got the bulldog. <laughs> every oh, market's yeah. got that guy. But if you guys are coming from an angle of service too, and like, I gotta say too, like how many situations did you have where you made that, that kind of ultimatum to a client who might've been acting out of pocket with one of your staff? Like how many times did they come around? I'm sure it happened, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, 75% of the time they would call and apologize. About 25% of the time they couldn't get the file. And that was okay. That was okay too. I mean, that yeah. was all right with me. No, like ultimately, you know, it's, it's standing, it's, it's, you know, standing your ground and like setting boundaries too. And like, I think a lot of the times too, there's this weird paradox because like on some level, it's like, you see these things where there's like, um, I wouldn't say entitlement, but it's like, sometimes there's a situation where the attorney is thinks that I deserve this because of X, Y, Z reason. But at the same time, there's on other, on other factors, an extreme fear to go against the client. And sometimes it's like the wrong thing. Like, you know, if you, if you know, I think it's worthwhile acting entitled in terms of setting your prices, but you know, in terms of being entitled on following up with somebody who's calling up on the phone, you know, that guy doesn't, really, that, that person doesn't really owe you anything. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of weird to, to see this happening, but I guess like when you get those things right, um, I guess that's really kind of where the magic happens. Right. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, and you want you, you know, listen, you never can build a great business law firm or anything with, with average employees. You got to have A players, a lot of A players. You can't have all A players because there's just not enough of them out there. But you want to hold on to them. And, you, and to hold on to them, you got to let them know that you care, right? And you got to be, their, like I said, you got to be their coach. Your job is to try to help them get what they want so they'll help you get what you want. And like I look at, you know, I said, like at Pilma now, I send out a survey. It's so like five quick questions every month to all my staff. And I want to know what their stress level is. And I want to know, you know, what they're really happy about, what they're really unhappy about. Is there anything we can do? Is there anything we need to change? You know, and every week we have a meeting and, and I ask them, what do we need to stop doing, start doing, or keep doing? You'll be surprised. Once they know that you actually listen to them, then they buy in and, and then they become vested and they, I call them like stakeholders, shareholders, although they're not, they don't own the stock. But when you can get an employee that feels like it's their business and they, they got to say so a little bit that you listen to them, especially with the younger crowd now it means a lot to them. I think it means a lot to everybody, but I think it's like very important for the 20 to 35 year olds. And so, and, and listen, they got a lot of good ideas because it's like, uh, you know, you're the general at the top of the hill, but really it's the guys down in the trenches that really knows what the hell's going on. It's like the guys making the sausage. I mean, you know, you, sometimes you don't know what's going on because you're too, you're, I don't know. Yeah. Well, especially as you get to the point where you scale up too. I mean, like you mentioned 47 staff, 13 attorneys, there's no way you can be a fly on the wall in every room like that at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you're going to be the guy who's putting the patterns together, but you're not going to get to see what that data is unless you have, you know, a good flow of getting people to that. And, you know, it's going to talk unless <laughs> they know they're being listened to at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I had a deal back then at the law firm. I had a suggestion box and it was pretty cool, man. So we had a, I had a suggestion box and, and I, and they put it in there and I give them points. 
whether we use it or not. If we used it, I give them so many points just for do, making the effort to give us suggestions. I said, I want suggestions on how to increase our profits or, or decrease our overhead. And if we implement it, then they got like, it just give me it, they got like five to 10 points. But then if we implement it, they go anywhere from 20 to, to 100 points. And at the end of the year, I'd add it up in the top three, I would give them, like one of them, I give them a week's paid vacation at that at my place at the beach. Second place might get a $1,500 gift card. And third place might get a $500. And uh, we would do the awards to, you know, make a big deal out of it. And the deal was we made it, they saved me, I had one at my deal that saved me like over $18,000 on my phone bill. I mean, I would have never thought of that. You know what I'm saying? And just yeah. little things. A lot sometimes it was stupid stuff and we didn't do it, but I still give them the points. But some of it was really good. You know, and, do, and then we, we have our monthly meeting and we, we go through them all and we tell them which ones we were going to implement and which ones we want. And, you know, everybody felt like they were vested. I mean, I don't know. You got to, people like to feel like they're part of something bigger. You know, and they like to, and then here's the big deal. They, they want to know that you care mm-hmm. and that you, you got to do some affirmation. I mean, you know, people don't quit because they're not making enough money. Uh, very seldom. They quit because number one, they got an asshole for a supervisor. And number two, they don't feel appreciated. That's the yeah. two top reasons people leave jobs. It, it's not, or and then third one is they don't feel like they got any room for advancement. Uh, that they've done studies. And fourth is money. It's not the number one thing. That ain't why people leave. Yeah. I guess say, especially times like this too, you know, it's a lot harder to feel like you're a part of something when everyone's just, you know, talking to their zoom screen all the time too. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I know one of the things you mentioned on our pre-call was uh, a couple of resources you had. I think one of them was around COVID, kind of a little bit of a segue there. But um, if people have been listening to this and, you know, as far as being part of something bigger, I know Pilma is something that people might be interested in joining. What's the best place to, you know, take the next step and, and get into your role, Ken? Yeah. You just go to Pilma, P-I-L-M-M-A dot O-R-G. And on our homepage, we've got a thing called uh, non-member resources. And we've got it. I got two or three ebooks in there uh, that I've written myself. I've got uh, some webinars that I've done. One of them is the seven levers of cash flow, which will blow your mind. I really, I, I like that one. And and all the lawyers liked it. It's ways to increase your cash flow without having to go borrow money from the bank. Very, it's something I learned from scaling up. I'm a scaling up certified and, and Vern Harness got it wrote Bass and Rockefeller habits of scaling up taught me that another one of my mentors. And it's just, we've got a whole lot. And then we got this thing, coronavirus, about how to manage remote employees and how to hold meetings, you know, how to use this Zoom to hold meetings, how to hold effective meet, Zoom meetings. Just different things. Some of it we wrote, some of it we pulled off from, you know, different places. What it, what, anything I thought would help the lawyers, I pulled it out. And then we had some, a bunch of uh, Zoom meetings that I did with different experts. We did that every week for like, four months and uh, it's out there. It's still on, it's still on our uh, resources, memory resources, a lot of good material. It really is. Uh, and I say that because not all of it's mine. I mean, I, I, if it's good, it's good. I'm going to use it. Uh, yeah. I, don't care who, I don't care who did it. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, yeah. And if you like that, I mean, we got a deal where, like I said, everything I do is hundred percent guaranteed. So you can try us out for 90 days. If it's not a good fit, you get your money back. If you go further and you don't grow 25%, then you get it another, you get it up to a year for free. You know, I don't know what else I can do. To, it's like uh, leading a horse to water. I keep making drink, <laughs> you know, but the deal is, I mean, I know it works. I mean, I guess I'm bragging a little bit. They, they, they kind of nicknamed me the millionaire maker. I made a lot of lawyers millionaires. And I always tell them, well, where's my share? They say, well, you got your share. Kid. <laughs> you got it up front. Yeah. yeah I was gonna say, hey, look, like you said earlier, it ain't bragging if it's true, right? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah, and I, and I like, and I, I enjoy it. I mean, I don't make the money I used to make, but man, my stress level is like 98% less. You know, it's stressful to run a big law firm. I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I loved it. And I learned a lot of things, you know, like uh, I got lawyers now that take two months off, you know, and go overseas with their family. I mean, I've got guys I took from six figures to seven figures, from seven figures to eight figures. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, you know, they listen, they do the work. It's like I told them, I said, I told one girl, girl, she's been with me like 12 years, and she's got like 18 lawyers now, and she's just killing it. 
And I said, you know, she said, I could have done this. I said, yeah, you would have done it. I said, I just helped you do it a lot faster. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, she would have, she would have got there, but I, I probably saved her hundreds of thousands, not millions. Plus I got her there about twice as fast as she would have got by herself, mm -hmm. you know, because I made all those mistakes for her. And I can tell her and then the mastermind she's, she's been in a mastermind since 12 years and she don't probably need to be in one. She just likes to be in it. You know, she likes, you know, she, she learns from other people's mistakes. You know, everybody's already done that or tried that. And love masterminds. I've been, I've been, I started, I was kind of like the innovator in, in the legal industry. Everybody says they're doing them now, but I think ours are the best, but I'll, I'm, I'm biased. I know I am, but, uh, I facilitated them for 15 years uh, and I've got five groups now. So, I mean, I've done a lot of mastermind meetings and it takes, uh, you got to have a special, it can't be about Ken Hardison. You got to let everybody engage. So the ones that are, want to hold the floor, you got to kind of quieten them down. And the ones that are quiet, you got to kind of pull stuff out of them. And then you're there at the end. If they don't get it, then you got to jump in and, and make sure they get the right answer, but it, but you don't want it to be that you don't want it to be all about you. You want everybody to be, it want to be like engaged with each other. That makes a great mastermind when everybody's sharing and giving. It's not just a, a taking. It's a lot of, uh, yeah, I, I make all mine sign non-disclosure agreements with, with liquidated damages. They cannot reveal. We do it from different markets so that they, uh, can speak freely. Cause you know, a lot of my, to be honest with you, a lot of mine are personal injury. We got some that are not, but, uh, and that's a very competitive market. As you know, I mean, that's more money spent on PPC, IPI lawyers, any other law in, in the world. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we used to do a lot of work in AdWords with the, with uh, the personal injury attorneys. And I was going to say, it's like, you know, I always call them, they're the, they're the Cowboys of uh, civil practice, <laughs> you know, yeah, they are. and they got big appetites too. <laughs> no, no one wants to be running a tidy six figure practice in personnel, uh, personal injury. That's for sure. No, they're all wanting to, they're like that guy I used to, I used to have this guy was, he's deceased now, bless his heart, but. Uh, I did some real estate deal with him and he was, he was very good at buying and selling real estate. And he said, I don't want it all. He said, I just want everything that joins mine. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> oh, man, that's hilarious. Uh, all right. So Ken, and then one last thing too, um, I, I'd also recommend to you, I mean, we brand new for one episode. I super appreciate you coming on, but if you want Ken every week, <laughs> you can also sign up for the grow your law firm podcast. You guys are closing on a year with that, right? Yeah. Well, you know, actually, I think we did our 65th episode last week we do one every every friday yeah we want you on our show too we got it oh fantastic all right awesome guys well um yeah i don't want to keep you too long uh can i think we got the top of the hour coming up but i'm um, super appreciate coming on the time i think the guests are our, our listeners are super appreciate it and um yeah it's been great spending some time with you and i'm looking forward to catching up again soon all right thank you it's been a pleasure man i appreciate it all right to you again thank you for listening to the law firm growth podcast for show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode. 